thank you, everyone. Uh, and so I think we had three really uh, fantastic talks uh, to start off uh, this session. And so now we'll move into the uh, discussion portion uh, and the questions. Um, and I see we already have people lined up, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over for uh, our first question. Uh, Dave Brown, Recombinetics. Uh, I guess I could address this to Dr. Brown, and that is with regard to operationally using a total genome-centric approach and looking at tumors, how, number one, that really assists you in making definitive clinical decisions like multi-combined therapies, be it multiple drugs or multiple approaches, and targeting therapies specifically, how simple genomics. It seems to me from two pieces of data that I'd like you to comment on was that you've shown, as we've known for a decade, that 80 percent of your uh, oncologic-based mutations are either going to fall into RAS oncogene mutations or P53 mutations. And the other piece of impressive data, I think, is general for this whole conference, and that is that only 20 percent of your oncologists accept these tools as being effective. And this is a sophisticated medical subspecialty where it probably has the greatest availability of using these molecular tools. So I guess the real question is, if that means 80 percent of your sophisticated physicians haven't accepted this, what is this going to mean across the whole panorama of medicine to more general physicians and being able to institute uh, true precision medicine as most of us in this room hope to see? Right. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, th that uh, comment and uh, the associated question because it's at the heart of this, isn't it? I, I would emphasize that the 20 percent figure related to physicians on a one-time basis at the very beginning, generally speaking, those were responses documented at registration as to the clinical impact of the information. So it's I would argue that uh, certainly we have a very engaged set of clinicians. We have uh, here at the SCI, we have 26 uh, hematologists, oncologists, and uh, the accrual for patients is uh, well distributed amongst those folks. I think the, the reasons why in uh, roughly 80 percent of the instances there was no clinical impact had to do, again, with um, the, the uh, gray zone of evidence on the one hand, and the, and the big issue is the access to uh, both uh, uh, associated uh, agents and to some degree to, um, um, to uh, clinical trials. You know, we see this as a proof of principle, and as I alluded to, our rapid intention is to broaden the biologic profiling. Uh, so that this is not, you know, that old phrase, uh, it's the economy. Well, it's, it's not just about DNA sequencing. And we're rapidly going to want to expand to broader profiling. So I actually uh, think for a, an early proof of principle, understand we just activated TAPER, which is the important ASCO-sponsored uh, basket trial that gives patients access to off-label uh, drugs for their uh, specific gene alterations and guarantees provision of the drug for three years. I think that these types of trials are increasing in number and will be uh, helpful in terms of increasing that clinical impact. That was a measurement of clinical impact. Is that, did that answer? No, that helps. I, I just would quickly say then you just alluded to enhancing the model. So I assume you're talking about multi-omic biomarker Absolutely. Approach. And that was, uh, again, I went through it very quickly, but on that arc, arcing, arching arrow, excuse me, um, the point of broader biologic profiling with some degree of transcriptomics, proteomics, microveomics, and certainly immune profiling. I mean, one of the most fascinating areas that this audience is well aware of is the nexus between uh, molecular oncology and immuno-oncology, genomics and immuno-oncology, I think is a, a very exciting proposition for those of us who are clinicians. And the last comment I would make, the, co the combinatorial point that you made is very important to clinicians. Uh, I think we all understand that it's going to be uh, a multi-agent approach that is likely to offer the greatest benefit, and we have to have systems that allow us to look at the impact of multiple agents on multiple targets without necessarily doing it in the old-fashioned empiric way. Maybe just to add something to this. Um, 
So we do a fair amount of cancer sequencing, both in my academic lab at Stanford, at clinical research, I might say, as well as a company I'm affiliated with called Personalis. And we always do RNA now associated with this because only a third of the potential driver genes are actually expressed. So we think that is a really valuable source of information. So if I can make one encouragement, it would be to get that in maybe even before 2018. Uh, um, so we do it routinely now for all the specimens we do. So. Great. Uh, Callie? Yeah, I was waiting to hear all the session. <laughs> And it's a very interesting panel because we have technologies and the director of a hospital and a center, essentially. And my question is the next. So mobile health will, is taking over. We heard a lot of a beautiful example of actionability in Mike's case. Um, and also Lara saying that there are even people using it very often and be happy as a user. Some others know. But it's very... We, we heard passion engagement, passion expectations, and actionability many, many times. So my question is how you can, you can see that this space will be driven by the consumers, and in this case, how we educate them, so technological literacy is not a problem. And in the second question is like, if we really partner with hospitals, and Mike proposed that there's the data centers um, that they are between hospitals, clinicians, and the consumer. My question is like, how we deal with the problem of interoperability and security? And um, for instance, yeah, we will have, what it means this data being in the IT warehouse in a hospital or in Apple? Like, what is health data anymore? Very philosophical question, what is health data? Um, so in terms of engaging the consumers, I think uh, the way that a consumer is going to engage is going to vary greatly by consumer, right? And so um, it's inherently a difficult problem. We've, we've had a lot of um, success with our sort of second generation um, studies by actually going out and, and talking to focus groups and understanding from the consumers what it is they find valuable about collecting this kind of information and how they may personally want to use it or other components that there might be within the study app themselves. And so, you know, we'll see how that does and we'll see if that and does in fact in increase our, our retention and, and, and help people actually find value in, in the work itself. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, th I think patient engagement is a huge problem because right, they, but right now people use these mobile devices as cute tricks. Mm -hmm. They use them for activity, they, get, they figure out their pattern within three months and then they throw their Fitbit in the drawer. And that's actually the standard time these days. You had a few that went out longer, but it's a very sharp drop off. But that's very different from being your health dashboard. And so I think as we add more of these things, like if it can tell you when you're getting sick, I think it will add more value that you'll want to keep it on longer. And I think the extreme example of this is, you know, type 1 diabetics or type 2 diabetics who have insulin regulation problems, they wear the continuous glucose monitor all the time because they want to know what's spiking them. I mean, there it could be life and death in, in the extreme circumstances. So I think what we'll get is somewhere in between that will have, you know, you know when it really does have general utility for health, and it may actually start with kids because I would love to have these devices on my kids because what do I do now? If I notice my child is you know, moving a little bit slowly. So what's the next step? You put your hand on their forehead. And after that, they stick an oral thermometer in their mouth. And the whole, you know, you go through these loops. In the future, I'm just going to pull up my smartphone and say, whoa, you're sick. You're not going to school today. <laughs> so I think that's how, and, and kids will get used to that. And I think maybe it'll take a generation to adapt. I hope it doesn't. But that is what's going to happen. I think you're, you, you will wear these devices just like your car has 400 sensors on it. probably don't even know that. You probably only know where about three of them are, the gas gauge, the engine overheating, and maybe one or two other things. Uh, but there's 400 sensors on your car. It all relays to your dashboard, and that's how it's going to roll out. And I think if we have the equivalent for a person, uh, you know, for, first of all, I think it's ludicrous that most people have a total of zero. Uh, sensors, that just makes no sense to me. 
uh, minus their immune system. I guess that's worth something. Um, <laughs> but I would argue that we should have these external sensors or possibly implants in the future that we'll be doing this all the time. It'll just be automatic. So. The, the other comment I'd like to make, because you're touching on uh, the other transformational change in healthcare, and that is um, you know, healthcare, the, certainly the majority of what we um, do for our patients and their families nowadays is outside of the hospital. And unfortunately, uh, most health systems in the United States are, to, are still looking at the world through, as I say, hospital eyes. And uh, that's the wrong set of lenses. I'm mixing metaphors here. But uh, the, the point is that uh, th that's the challenge we've had. In, in the system uh, that I work in, the Swedish system, we're trying hard to refocus our efforts at population health. But when the entire um, reimbursement approach is on uh, volume as opposed to value, that's difficult. Um, so it, it's a very important point. I think consumers are going to be major drivers. Uh, I, shouldn't, I should rephrase that, are major drivers of this change. Uh, there's some interesting things that are happening. I mentioned our, our molecular tumor board. We don't currently do this, though we're contemplating doing it. Uh, there are some tumor boards, molecular tumor boards around the country that routinely invite uh, the patient or their advocate to the molecular tumor board. And that's uh, one small step, but important step to uh, achieve patient engagement. Great, Jeff. So uh, I'd like to follow on Kelly's uh, really great comments and questions to the, the panel. Um, your uh, three presentations to me were kind of the intersection of uh, Simon Sinek, the reason why, and Malcolm Gladwell, the tipping point. Um, and I'm reminded that in 1991, we uh, put an organization together that now has over 100,000 physicians that are trying to apply systems biology into healthcare, and they're not waiting. They're trying to do it right now. And so there's, a, there's this emergent structure that's occurring that's not top down, it's bottom up, and it's uh, advocacy related. These are people that are going back actually on their own to study biochemistry and crack open books that they probably hated when they were in medical school. and trying to bring themselves up into molecular biology, molecular genetics, and really trying to find ways to address where 75% of our healthcare costs are, which is in chronic disease, and uh, for which the solutions one pill at a time isn't the answer. So I'm wondering from your three perspectives, uh, and you did just such a magnificent job, each of you, in kind of uh, painting this landscape, how you see this, uh, this emerging structure actually creating an architecture for the healthcare in the 21st century. Well, Jeff, uh, thanks for those comments. I, I want to add something to um, the concept that you have pioneered uh, through the specialty of functional medicine because th there's, there's a framing that I found to be very effective with uh, fellow uh, physicians, and that is that healthcare is about uh, behavior, uh, environment, and biology. I usually say biology first, but I purposely reverse them. And the, the point is, I think that concept um, is, is key to the change that is necessary that you're alluding to. And, and when you mentioned to experienced physicians, biology, be, behavior, and environment, that resonates terrifically. I think they, they need to be given the handles uh, to, to approach each one of those areas and bring them together. But I think that's the underpinning concept that you've pioneered, and I think it's a very important one. Yeah, I'll add on to say that, you know, from my perspective, which is looking at, at research um, more than clinical care, we found that engaging patients or participants in that process has been really transformative to the work that we did. One of the first mobile studies we started looking at was in a, a, a small rare disease population of Fanconi anemia, and bringing together the researchers and the participants there the very first thing that happened was the participant said, well, why are you studying that? I don't care about that. I care about this other thing, and why won't you study that for me? That's what I want to know. And so it was very bottom-up in that sense that, that, that pulling together the community of the people who care most about what we're go the outcomes are going to be is, are really going to help guide us in the right direction. My own view is we need both. We need top-down and bottom-up. We really need to educate the physicians because they can't act upon what they don't understand. And the instant, it's a very conservative profession, instantly it's pushed back. 
as soon as the new technology comes along. Well, you haven't proven this for the longest time, right? Don't bring in genome sequencing into cancer, even though it's obvious to most of us, well, if that was your kid, would you get their genome sequence? They, they absolutely say yes. But they would always say, well, nobody's shown, nobody's shown. So it's a very conservative pr uh, profession in general. So I think we have to educate people. Uh, the, we have to educate the physicians, and certainly the new ones coming out in the CME courses we have to do. But I was also argue we need to educate people as well because they have to understand what's going forward. I personally think, and those of you who were at the town hall last night, I personally think uh, nobody can understand you like you can understand you. Physician has 15 minutes. They really can't figure themselves, they won't figure you out, any of these complex diseases. So. And uh, uh, you can do it better than they can. And so I think it's a matter of getting yourself educated, finding the information. Uh, again, I think I said this last night, if something goes wrong in any of my family members, my extended family, they always come to me and I don't know anything. I'm a PhD, I'm worthless. Uh, so I Google things up just the same as they do. And I might understand a little bit more from the background. Then I call, you know, the head of cardiology. That's my one ace in the hole or something. <laughs> I can call, I have the contacts that, that, uh, that they may not have, and I collect this information, but at the end, it's, it's a research project for every single patient when it gets complicated, it's not obvious. And that's what has to be done, and I think it, it involves the patient, because you're always going back and forth, it involves knowledgeable people. And I think it would be good to get the consumer, uh, you know, engaged in this as well. They, they, also, they also hate to be, you know, pushed off of the whole thing, have the doctor describe, well, here's what you should do, when they often want to know what's going on. So I think we've got to get both sides engaged. Yeah, I really agree with that, Mike. The other concept, and it's probably more specific in some ways to cancer medicine, is that high quality cancer medicine is inextricably linked to the conduct of clinical research because of the rapid evolution of knowledge and the application of that knowledge, um, as I was saying, with the evidence-based uh, vetting uh, that has to be a continual process. So I agree that uh, the, the person, the patient, their family need to be active participants, not just in the clinical care, but, but in the inextricably linked uh, research that is part of high quality cancer care. There are, you know, Dr. Tuttle and I have talked about this before. She's a, a nephrologist and an active translational researcher in that area. And one could say that maybe in kidney disease that that aspect isn't as, as ingrained in uh, the usual clinical care, but I think she and I would argue that it is at some level. Um, so I think that uh, we, we, we have this false division between clinical care and research, and I think that gets us into trouble on occasion. Great. So are you yeah. there to ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please yeah. Do. <laughs> Very quick question for Mike. So you suggest that a viral infection triggered a, uh, the diabetes, right? Which uh, I suggest what? Sorry, I missed the a, a viral infection triggered the diabetes. It could be true. It could be a temporal coincidence. Or it's a, in my case, that's the prevailing hypothesis. Yeah. So, yes. so, but uh -huh. so if it's true, then it means that a, a genetic predisposition becomes manifest due to a totally uncontrollable extrinsic factor, which also means that it will be very hard to prevent or how do we act on that if such an unspecific trigger can, can uh, you know, make a predisposition become manifest? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's the viral infection or the associated stress response. It's the time I actually got the most sick of all those 10 viral infections. So it's conceivable that had I suppressed that with, uh, I hate to say it, but I stopped taking, you know, antihistamines and things like this when I started the study because I didn't want to disrupt the experiment. <laughs> so uh, it's conceivable that had I been taking, you know, suppressing the associated inflammation and stress, maybe, maybe I could have blocked that, I don't know. But we don't have data, right? There's zero data on this whole thing. Although interestingly, it's, it's very interesting, more I learn about type 2 diabetes, 20% of people will actually respond to anti-inflammatories, uh, whereas 80% uh, don't. So maybe I'm in that 20%, I don't know. But the point is, uh, um, I don't know fully yet, but there might be ways in the future. Minimally, what it means is that every time you get a very nasty viral infection, or I get one, I better check my sugar pretty closely. Now, I do anyway, because I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor. So, um, 
but in principle, if I did, wasn't doing that, I, I should be checking, right, if I'm very prone. I can tell you anecdotally, it's not just me. I've had a number of people literally after that first paper come out, write to me and say, this is not real science, I don't take it over serious, but they've written to me and said, you know, either they or a family member after some mononucleosis, some nasty event, had the same situation. So it, all I can say to that is it needs further investigating. Now, we have had a few folks convert to diabetics during our study. Um, scientifically, I was hoping it was more, but I'm glad it's from a personal <laughs> side it's not. Uh, and nobody spiked up the way I've spiked up, so maybe I'm unique. But, you know, nobody's even studied this before to know how often people spike up in their glucose that way or they go up gradually. So this is what we're learning. That's why we need a million of these profiles. Yes, next, next question. Hello, thank you for your presentations. It's great to see uh, the practitioners reduce to practice these technologies that you know, us in the computational sciences or in the big data space try to construct. And, you know, Dr. Brown, you had mentioned that one of the biggest challenges is basically adoption of these technologies by practitioners. And I know that the other panelists have mentioned, too, that uh, consumer adoption also sometimes lags behind where you'd like it to be for integration of these studies into your uh, kind of adoption with your study protocol. So I guess my follow-up question was to dig a little deeper into that and just push you guys to try to get at, you know, to, to the hypotheses we have in technology is that these things could either relate to um, usability or efficacy of, of the platforms. And so I'll just break those down a little bit further. Is it one of those two definitely or, or both of them? And then if it's usability, is it more of a technical barrier or more of the scaffolding slash language barrier in terms of their mental constructs? And then the second question about is if it's efficacy related, is it because of its congruence or reduction to practice that makes it challenging? Or is it because of the belief of the efficacy of the platform that makes it challenging for adoption? Well, I, I, I could take the easy answer and say all of the above, right? Uh, the, the point, though, is that for busy clinicians, uh, this concept of not creating a separate workflow of trying to integrate into the existing workflow is, is the common mantra. The problem with that is that sometimes the current workflow is not a good one. Um, so one has to, if one has uh, a workflow that's, that's strong uh, with a, a, a multifunctional EMR, then you want to work through that. And that's what I briefly described with our PSYAPS application. We've embedded it effectively in the electronic medical record. So, you, you know, the mundane but important stuff, you don't have to have a separate ID and password. You get into the EMR and you're into the genomic data and it's integrated into the, the regular uh, clinical information as it should be. Uh, so I, I think that uh, that's, that's a big issue. I think the, the other issue for clinicians is, again, uh, this notion that I, I, we were talking during the break that uh, back when uh, CT imaging first came into the fore, the notion that you could down to ultimately a couple millimeters uh, look inside the human body was really a change. It's one that we're accustomed to now, but it, it drove a change in practice, and it drove a change in the way physicians evaluated their patients. Well, the same thing is happening with these uh, mechanistic pathways and how physicians think about their patients. And for physicians who weren't trained in that context or who haven't taken it upon themselves to, to be trained in that context, it's a challenge. So tools that facilitate that education, like the molecular tumor board. The other thing I wanted to slip in, and we were talking with Ilya and Theo about this during the break, is um, you know we're uh, looking at um, a proof of principle project where we're going to use a learning system technology to model information from our molecular tumor board to serve as a guide as patients come to the molecular tumor board where one can effectively, in almost a Bayesian-like way, uh, anticipate how that patient might do or what therapies might be more appropriate, again, using uh, a modest N to arrive at those conclusions. So I think all of those things can, can help uh, close the gap as far as the physician's uh, engagement. Uh, I'd say from the consumer side, um, certainly, uh, Usability will get some of the way there, but but not the whole way. And in terms of efficacy, it's it's a matter of, of who it's efficacious for. You know, for a 
for a consumer using a, an app or a wearable, what do, what do they want to get out of that? And do they need to wear it for a year or, uh, or longer to get that? You know, really, they're interested in monitoring their health when they feel a change in their health state. And so they might come back to it um, in, those, in those times in a way that they won't engage with it um, more continuously. And I think that different models for engagement will end up being used across um, different conditions depending on what it is you're really wanting to, to measure. And we have to recognize that, that it's, it's not going to be the same answer for everything. And I, I think uh, you heard this in uh, certainly Lara's presentation and Mike's as well. I think patient reported outcomes, either on the clinical side of the fence or in research, are increasingly important for a variety of reasons, part of which we've been talking, or some of which we've been talking about in terms of this, this to some degree, well, it has to be patient-centered and, in that context, consumer-driven. But there are also other reasons in terms of the efficiency of getting, you know, Mike uh, has said multiple times, and I couldn't agree with him nor, more, that uh, the, you, the individual, know more about yourself in certain contexts than any other human being will, will know, no matter how expert they are, um, for a variety of reasons. So patient-reported outcomes, I think, is another uh, goal uh, to support that from a bioinformatics standpoint, to me, is important. 